Hello, everyone. My name is Ting Xu. I'm a research scientist at Chang Mai Institute. Today, I'm going to talk to you about unsupervised machine learning techniques that we have been doing in neuroimaging. Uh, in this lecture, uh, I will focus on two unsupervised machine learning techniques, clustering and embeddings. Uh, I hope by the end of that lecture, you'll learn how these two techniques are used for neuroimaging and how we evaluate the results. I will also introduce some potential uh, issues that's specific for new imaging data that we need to pay attention to when applying machine learning techniques. Uh, let me start by showing some facts of our brain data. It is extremely high dimensional. On average, the human brain has 86 billion neurons for macaque and mouse, um, the common animal model that we used to study brain the numbers of neurons are still tremendous. At a resolution of typical uh, neuroimaging data using fMRI, for example, showing here, it's four millimeter resolution functional connectome. We still have to deal with 100,000 of units and almost uh, four to five billion pairwise connections between um, nodes. And this is just for one individual brain. As we know, uh, each brain is unique. In neuroimaging, we also need to take care of this individual variation in the data. For example, uh, what's shown here are 10 uh, individual brains and they are cortical sickness uh, from human connectome projects. As you can see, uh, the size, uh, shape are different across individuals. Such individual variation adds another layer of dimension for the neuroimaging data. Also, uh, when we deal with the functional data, we're actually uh, collecting a chunk of uh, time series from uh, each unit, we call it voxel. Uh, so we end up have the time series data for 100,000 voxels uh, for each individual. And to better characterize the morphology of the data in imaging, we also conduct, uh, constructed the, the surface mesh and projected the data from the volume space to the surface space. So the spatial relationship of the, the data points is not uh, random. Uh, the location has, uh, follows the brain uh, morphology. And the data collected in the volume space can be stored in different ways like on the surface. So when we deal with new imaging data, we also need to keep this in mind. So um, to handle this high dimensional data, the first thing we can think of is to reduce the dimension. Here on uh, supervised machine learning techniques, uh, clustering becomes uh, very handy. Unlike supervised machine learning, uh, clustering algorithms are data-driven uh, approaches uh, designed for understand the subsystem of the data. In neuroimaging, we refer this problem as uh, brain parcellation. There are a number of clustering methods, the classic techniques like hierarchical clustering, uh, K-means, uh, spectral clustering, uh, independent component analysis, um, graph-based uh, community detection, for example, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those uh, clustering methods basically group bring um, regions that are more similar to each other uh, into a cluster. There are also spatial constraint clustering. Uh, usually the constraint clustering is um, considered as a semi uh, supervised technique, but here we can think of this uh, spatial constraint is um, adding the uh, brain attribution, like the shape, into uh, the data. The clustering uh, boundaries are the border that separate different uh, brain areas. Under this assumption, methods like a region growing and edge detection are developed for new imaging data. So uh, let's start with the independent component analysis, ICA. More than 15 years ago, when resting state fMRI started to arise in neuroimaging, uh, ICA was selected as a method to reduce the dimension of the data and identify uh, brain networks. This is because ICA is a method uh, designed for separating uh, signal source. And resting state fMRI mirrors the brain oscillation where the participants are in the scanner and not performing any specific task. Uh, 
But during this time, the brain is not doing nothing. Instead, it oscillates uh, like an orchestra uh, playing a symphony. Uh, so you can think of this analogy uh, that's ICA, uh, basically the cluster, our brain, uh, basically tries to identify the components, more specifically non-Gaussian components that are statistically independent from each other. In other words, ICA tries to identify, for example, the violin zones, the, the cello zone, the flute zone, different instrument zones uh, in our brain. And different from PCA, the technique I will uh, talk about later, ICA components don't um, have the orthogonal, um, don't have to be orthogonal, but it has to be independent. And using ICA, we did identify brain networks, uh, visual uh, network, separate uh, the cerebellum, and so on and so forth. Nowadays, the tool uh, to perform ICA is uh, pretty well developed. Uh, for example, Milotic uh, from FSL group, uh, gift from Mesenko Hu group. ICA is not a use, uh, only useful for identifying the networks, but also uh, used to um, identify the noise component from motion uh, respiration. Uh, but when we apply the ICA uh, to across individuals, uh, we also need to uh, pay attention to the individual variation. Usually the group ICA assumes that the group is homogeneous and all the subjects share the common components. However, this is not always true. Uh, we're aware of individual differences. In this sense, besides the common components across individual, we also want the ICA to discover the unique components in subgroups. Here's an example uh, solution. Uh, GRECA uh, generalized ranking and averaging ICA by reproducibility. Uh, basically, GRECA runs multiple ICAs uh, on individual data and identify the components that are uh, mostly uh, reproducible across groups. Because ICA runs on individual data sets separately, it doesn't assume the data is uh, homogeneous across all the individual and the final outputs uh, components uh, have the reproducibility score um, that, which index how um, components are similar across individuals. In this way, for example, we can identify the, uh, the subregions of the formal network, um, precuneus, uh, that is um, very uh, unique uh, in young and adult group, but not in the elder participants. Other uh, deformal network uh, regions can be universal uh, across uh, lifespan. Now uh, let's look at another classroom technique. When resting state FMI uh, became a widely used paradigm with over thousands data sets available in new imaging, Thomas Yaw made use of a large data sets and performed clustering to identify the brain networks. This is a textbook study and networks are uh, probably the most commonly used networks in current new imaging field. Um, the clustering algorithm uh, applied here has uh, no prior, but requires a number of clusters as an input. Shown the point sample uh, in the study, uh, the clustering algorithm basically operates um, by assigning the data points to different uh, groups and then iteratively reassign the group membership of points to maximum the agreement among the points uh, of the same group based on their functional uh, connectivity profile. Among the solution with different total uh, number of cluster, um, reproducibility across um, independent data set discover and uh, replication samples was used to measure the result stability. And then as you can see, uh, some number of clustering solution would be the best. And finally, the seven and 17 networks are, are chosen to be the solution and uh, builds the, the final uh, postulations. 
As mentioned earlier, the clustering algorithm are data-driven approaches, but brain data has its unique uh, attributes. Uh, the locations are not random, uh, area or puzzles tends to be uh, spatially um, contiguous. So when clustering the brain, we also want to take this into account. One example shown here is called region growth, uh, region growing methods. These algorithms start uh, from the seeds, uh, which are most stable region um, in their functional connectivity. Then uh, grow from the seeds to the neighboring regions until it um, um, mats the regions grow from another seeds. After that, we have those, those uh, initial puzzles. Then uh, we can apply um, like hierarchical uh, clustering algorithm to, um, to group these initial puzzles into larger uh, clusters. At this level, uh, there's no spatial constraint. Uh, smaller initial puzzles that are not uh, contiguous uh, can be grouped into uh, the same cluster. In this way, the results um, identify the brain clusters, uh, but at the same time, it also respected the local brain morphology. Another uh, spatial constraint technique is edge detection. So think of a uh, clustering problem as detecting uh, boundaries. The edge detection methods mirrors the change of functional connectivity profile across neighboring regions here. Uh, for example, the angular gyrus and the supermarginal gyrus. And you see the functional connectivity profile could be very different. And once we across a certain uh, regions, there was a, a sharp change of functional connectivity. And that is the boundary we're trying to uh, detect. And this edge detection method has been uh, extended to the surface earlier using the functional connected profile, um, but later adding the uh, new uh, um, uh, the anat anatomy features that um, create this uh, multimodal parcellation. Specifically, this method uh, compares the similarity between the neighboring uh, vertices by computes the first uh, derivatives, the spatial gradients along the surface. Uh, this um, gradients, the high gradients uh, indicates there's a sharp uh, change in spatial map uh, from um, one vertices to the neighboring vertices. Uh, so if there's a, a sharp change, um, there, uh, it indicates a potential uh, boundaries of the uh, brain area. Now here comes the interesting part. If we pay attention to the visual area, the gradient-based methods uh, parcelates the visual area um, very well along the cytoarchitecture architecture based V1, V2 borders. And um, if you remember correct, uh, if you remember the clustering result from uh, YAL7 networks, uh, the visual area are separate from inside uh, to outside, which is consistent with the eccentricity activation uh, mapping. So these two solutions are, are both correct. Both reflect the cortical organization, but both but they are from different classroom uh, methods. The gradient-based uh, methods might emphasize the local change, and another one might uh, just focus on the global similarity. That's, uh, that's why we have the, the both methods um, cluster the, the, the brain regions in different way, but both correct. In neurogen, different clustering techniques are widely used for brain parcellation, and they might all capture these brain organization for a certain degree. Uh, here's a list of group level parcellation summarized in a very nice systematic comparison study. They also summarized the, and compile um, the individual level parcellation. Uh, so the question is, if cluster results capture a certain degree of true brain organization, how do we evaluate the results? Here are some criteria to consider. First, as an unsupervised uh, machine learning technique, the clustering results should be reliable and reproducible across sessions if we uh, apply to the individual data. 
There are certain dynamic in brain organization, of course, but the postulation algorithm itself should be able to detect more similar postulation uh, pattern within individual than uh, cross individuals. Second, the group level postulation um, should be reproducible across samples like Yao postulation repeated in two independent samples. Only if this is reproducible, the group level postulation can be adopted uh, to another uh, studies. Third, uh, a good postulation should provide homogeneous features within parcel, at least better than random assembled postulation with the same parcel size. Um, last uh, but not least, no matter how fancy the clustering algorithm is, um, the result needs to be valid. It's true that unsupervised learning is a data-driven method to discover whatever the structure hiding behind the data, but sometimes noise or bias can also make the result reliable. Um, so we want the result to be meaningful, which means um, that we need to check if the result have uh, agreement with a prior study from other modality, for example, or if the result can uh, facilitate the brain behavior prediction. So um, let's look at some potential issues that uh, my, um, we, we might need to pay attention uh, to avoid, otherwise we would end up have some bias. First is the geometric effect. Uh, when mapping uh, alpha data of a given resolution from volume to the uh, surface, larger voxels can artificially increase the local coordination between the neighboring uh, surface vertices. This is true across uh, multiple uh, integration methods. Uh, you can imagine a large uh, voxel can span um, both sides of the of a sulcus or a thin uh, jarry uh, white matter. And the worst thing is such artifacts is not random, but structured bias follows the uh, folding pattern of our brain. So if we don't pay attention to it, you might find detect some local reliable pattern follows the, the, the curvature, but that is totally driven by the uh, anatomy, not really your functional data. Here, the standard uh, surgical case surface mesh has neighboring uh, distance about two to 2.5 millimeter. So uh, when the volume data is roughly the same uh, resolution, then uh, such local effect, uh, artifacts can be avoided. Another uh, effect comes from the resampling step. Uh, take the spatial gradient method as an example. We can uh, make some data uh, in the native uh, surface, which has uh, constant spatial gradients on the native surface. And we don't want the registration uh, change the, the, this uh, gradients. However, if we sample the data from native to the templates, then calculate the spatial gradient again, after that, we'll see the spatial gradient is not um, constant anymore. So when we apply machine learning technique uh, to the new engine data, uh, we need to understand how the data is constructed to avoid such uh, bias. And back to the algorithm, is there any way that we can make the result more reliable instead of collecting um, more data? So one strategy is uh, bagging by bootstrapping the individual data uh, and the group level clustering. So even 10 times of bagging can increase the stability of the results more than collecting double amounts of the data. Another strategy is to concatenate the data. Uh, when concatenate the shorter sessions together, the reliability is better than the data that runs um, from a single session with equal total uh, level. So in ABCD studies, um, we have shorter sessions um, designed to, to uh, control the head motion. But in this case, we can think of um, using the data concatenation and the bagging to increase the reliability of the cluster. So tools for clustering, uh, Scikit-learn and Nylon are two Python packages are available for lots of clustering methods. And uh, there are also 
bootstrapping uh, package and uh, uh, the spatial uh, gradient method I mentioned before uh, is also implemented in the connector workbench. Now uh, let's um, look the high dimensional data again. We have cluster technique that reduce the, the nodes dimension. Still, we would like to understand the structure of such connectum. Instead of reduce the dimension of the uh, nodes, now this time we need to reduce the dimension of the connectum to simplify the data. So how can we do that? Embedding uh, is a technique that we can use in this case to re reduce such dimension and to discover the structure of the, the connectum uh, in um, simplified embedding space. So what is embedding? Simply put, embedding is a low dimensional space that represents high dimensional data. For example, PCA, the principal component analysis is one of the most known embedding methods. Uh, here's an example that's PCA component um, represents <clears throat> the, the directions that uh, the data spreads the, uh, the most. And uh, um, the first PC uh, component here uh, can explain 91% of the variation. So we can pretty much understand uh, the data, um, what's going on along the first uh, PC uh, direction in this PC space. In Imogen, uh, PC is simple, powerful, and very useful. For example, McShane applied the PCA to the multitask uh, both time series and identify a smaller uh, set of PCs. The first five PCs account for uh, almost 70% of the variation here. And by uh, placing the both signal back to each of the component direction, the PPC here, we find, for example, the first component reflects the most of the task block uh, structure. And instead of figure out the high dimensional brain data across time, it's just easier to only study the first few pieces through this uh, PC space. A second example is from John Murray's group. Um, they also performed TCA on the gene expression data and detected the regional pattern of gene expression across the human cortex. The first PC explained almost 30% of the variation and reflected the dot the dominant uh, spatial pattern of gene expression uh, profile across the cortex and is very similar to the Malin uh, T1-T2 racial map. Now, um, um, it's not only uh, new image data we can use PCA, we can also apply to the behavior data to reduce the dimension of behavioral uh, data and, or understand its underlying structure. This is an example that also applying PC on the psychosis sim symptom and uh, uh, cognitive deficit measurements. And it finds the original factors from our pens. Uh, didn't align the data-driven uh, PC axis, but the new PCs showed better brain behavior association in later uh, prediction. So how do we do PCA? Uh, basically, to find which direction the data varies most, first, we um, need to standardize our data for each variable, and then we can extract the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix from the data. The eigenvectors represent the direction in which our data are uh, spread, uh, and the eigenvalue, uh, lambda, represents uh, how the data is um, spread out along uh, the uh, different uh, directions. We can project the data along each direction uh, to understand um, the data in this uh, low dimensional space. Uh, in real calculation, we actually use SVD, the singular value decomposition to extract the PCs. So instead of calculating the covariance matrix, then extract the uh, eigenvectors, uh, we can do SVD on the data matrix X directly. And uh, X can be written as a 
a unitary matrix uh, U multiplied by the diagonal uh, singular value matrix S and uh, unitary matrix V. Then the covariance matrix here can be written uh, in this format. And compare this to, uh, we can find that the eigenvalue uh, lambda is equal to the S squared divided by N minus one and the principal components uh, X V can be written by uh, SU from the SVD. There are lots of uh, tools for PCA, Scikit-learn, MATLAB, and uh, embedding uh, toolbox bring space or provides uh, handy functions to perform PCA. So PCA is simple, but next question, uh, what if the data is not linear? Think of the data is a rainbow uh, Swiss row. So if we look at the, the Swiss row along the X dimension here, uh, then we see the color, the dots are mixed. And if we uh, look at the data along the Y dimension, uh, the color is also uh, the mixed. So the original space X and the Y doesn't really uh, help us to understand the data. But if we apply PCA, it doesn't really uh, help to us to understand the data either. So in such case, we need to, um, uh, to apply nonlinear dimension reduction methods uh, manifold. Instead of using the linear PCA, we actually need to decompose the data along the manifolds, along this um, switch row to capture this uh, rolling uh, direction. Uh, so here, if we do manifold learning, for example, the diffusion mapping that uh, I will talk about uh, shortly, we can clearly decompose the switch row in this uh, embedding space along uh, the X uh, direction here. It's a switch row um, unrolled from one end to the other, another end. And along the uh, Y uh, axis here, it's a unrolled switch row uh, from the edge uh, to the inside. So in this way, manifold learning can be very useful to disentangle the nonlinear structure of the data and uh, place the data in a simple embedding space. We can use such manifold learning um, to study the morphology of the object. In imaging, we can use uh, to characterize morphology of the brain uh, shape. Here's an example that we apply diffusion mapping uh, to human and macaque uh, surface and identify the match uh, structure of the, the brain morphology across species. Uh, here's a, another example of manifold um, in uh, learning in uh, functional data to decompose the, the spatial pattern of the uh, brain organization. So uh, let's look at the demo. Showing here is the, uh, the source the components, two source components uh, with different uh, direction, uh, the uh, spatial gradients. Uh, but if combined, um, which is we, what we might observe from the data, that is combined uh, from different source, that could lead us uh, in a wrong conclusion that the, that the data has a gradient along uh, this direction. Uh, so what um, Hank proposed here is a Laplace embedding technique to identify uh, such underlying uh, gradients. And it works. So the two components maps in visual area are detected. Both are correct. One reflects eccentricity bands and another reflects the polar angle <coughs> mapping, excuse me. And if we uh, don't perform such uh, Laplacian embedding uh, decomposition, we might end up observe this uh, wrong uh, results like showing uh, here. Now, how do we perform Laplacian embedding? Compared to PCA, Laplacian embedding extracts the eigenvector of Laplacian uh, matrix, which is the uh, degree uh, matrix minus the adjacent matrix, uh, or uh, normalized the Laplacian matrix, uh, which balance the influence of the nodes uh, with um, larger degree. 
And if you would like to perform love blushing bedding, in brain regions, um, like uh, Hank did, he provides a toolbox on the GitHub. Uh, it's called uh, Congrats. And there are other tools available as well, uh, embedding uh, toolbox brain space and uh, Cyclin. So is there any other um, manifold learning? Yes. So in this study, uh, Daniel Marcus used a different diffusion um, different embedding technique, diffusion map, uh, diffusion mapping to extract the components that capture the principal ingredients of the uh, uh, micro scale cortical organization. Here are the first two components and the embedding space uh, built by these two components. The first component reflects the gradient from the primary area, including the sensory and the modal area. Uh, to the high order uh, transmodal uh, regions like the formal network. Uh, the second component reflects the spectrum from the uh, visual area to the modal area. The embedding space is consistent with uh, a brain organization models proposed in 1998. The second component separates uh, different uni unimodal regions and the first component uh, aligns with this uh, hierarchy uh, from outside to inside uh, the brain organized in a dimension that integrates uh, different unimodal regions in a hierarchical manner. It also captured the spatial layout of brain networks starting from anywhere on the surface. Um, if we um, go along the first gradient, uh, we can always find the network uh, follows the hierarchy, uh, hierarchical order from the deformed network, uh, from the parietal to attention and ends up uh, primary sensory uh, networks. So uh, how do we perform such diffusion uh, mapping embedding? It is uh, a bit more complex than PCA and the Laplacian embedding. Start from the affinity matrix, which can be constructed by calculating the cosine similarity of the thresholded uh, functional connectivity uh, matrix. We need to construct a transition matrix of a Markov chain M and uh, extract the diffusion map, uh, which uh, is calculated by the eigenvalue and uh, eigenvectors of uh, M to the uh, T's power. And we can think of this uh, diffusion map as if we uh, walk through a graph. At each node, we don't uh, decide which uh, direction we like to go, but we follow the uh, probability of each node would lead us to. And the first diffusion map would be the direction that the graph uh, would most likely lead us to. And uh, the tools for such calculation are also available. The code from Satra on GitHub uh, or uh, the MATLAB the Python code from embedding toolbox brain space. And we just need to uh, set up the, uh, choose the, the, uh, the method to be a diffusion map. And using such uh, diffusion mapping techniques, lots of brain ingredients are discovered. For example, the Laplacian embedding and diffusion embedding both identified the anterior to posterior gradients in hippocampus and similar structure, a hierarchical structure is also identified in cerebellum. Applying the uh, embedding in developmental sample, uh, Boris group identified the first uh, embedding in units is the gradients across unimodal regions um, between visual and uh, modal cortex. Um, interestingly, units showed the second gradient along the uh, anterior to posterior axis instead of hierarchical gradients. And Shinian's group uh, finds that the modality gradients are uh, dominant in, in the brain development until um, 30 to 40 years old, then the first uh, gradients uh, shifts and the hierarchy gradients start to dominate the brain organization. And besides all the human data, embedding techniques are also um, applied to other species, 
and helped us to understand the brain organization across species. A collection of gradients are uh, published last year uh, in Imaging uh, Special Issue. And lots of them use diffusion embedding, uh, which highlights the importance of embedding technique in neuroimaging. So before you start to use this embedding technique, there's something more uh, you need to know, which is the component scores from um, the, the embedding or PCA doesn't really have a direction. For example, in PCA, we care about uh, in which axis uh, the data are spread out the most. The output uh, score uh, doesn't really matter if it is positive or negative, it's arbitrary. And for manifold, we can define the insides uh, of the switch row as a positive. We can also define the outside switch row as positive. It doesn't matter, we, we care about um, whether the data uh, showing meaningful spectrum along the manifold or along the PC uh, direction. And because the direction is arbitrary, when we uh, apply the embedding in different data sets, for example, different individuals, sometimes outputs um, embedding score are not aligned. For example, here um, is, a, uh, is an example um, we apply embedding for three individuals. And if we look at the first dimension, uh, we find the, uh, the subject B uh, has the inverse uh, direction uh, compared to subject A and C. In addition, um, across uh, data sets, not only the direction, but sometimes the order of the component can be not matched. Uh, here, the dimension uh, three in A and B match with the dimension two uh, in uh, C. And dimension uh, two in A and B uh, match with the dimension uh, three uh, in C. So to compare or combine those component cross subjects, we need to match the components uh, using progressive matching. Basically, it's a linear transformation that contains translation, reflection, orthogonal uh, rotation, and scaling. But here we usually only apply the rigid transformation and don't apply any uh, scaling factor because we care about the scale of the data itself for each individual. And in brain space, uh, we can set alignment uh, method as procrastis. If we use MATLAB, we just need to turn off the scaling factor. There's also another way to align individual. Here is an um, example. Uh, on the right is procrastinate matching in bank space. And on the left is align individual from another technique called joint embedding. Basically, in procrastinate alignments, uh, calculation and uh, the matching step are separate. We calculate the component first, and then we align them uh, using procrastinate. And joint embedding uh, method merges two steps together by calculating and concatenates, sorry, by calculating um, uh, and concatenates the affinity matrix together into a joint uh, uh, matrix, and then apply the embedding on top of this joint uh, matrix. In this way, we simultaneously extract the component across these sets. As you can see, uh, the output uh, aligns uh, better. Uh, here we see the joint embedding components show high uh, within and high between individual similarity, or importantly, uh, also show high discontinuity across individuals, which means joint embedding uh, aligns the component across individual well, but at the same time, individual unique feature can be preserved so that they are able to differentiate individual uh, from each other. So this is uh, very useful when handling inhomogeneous sample like lifespan sample. Here, um, you can see how uh, aligned components change across lifespan from six to 82 years old and different networks becomes uh, more segregated in early childhood to uh, adulthood, but aggregate again around uh, 50 to uh, 60. And using joint uh, embedding alignments, we can also extract a match component uh, across uh, species between human and macaque monkeys. As you can see, each component can be treated as one dimension to build the embedding space. 
uh, the human macaque uh, connectome can be mapped into this uh, embedding space and uh, gets aligned. So how do we do joint embedding? Uh, brain space also uh, provides an option. However, it's, uh, if we concatenate the connectivity matrix from all the subject together, soon your computer might be blow up because uh, when concatenates the, all the connectivity matrix across subject, it will kill the memory uh, quickly. So the trick is instead of concatenate subjects together all at once, we can do joint embedding for each subject one by one by concatenates each subject with the group reference. Uh, then we do this um, for each subject. And after that, we just need to uh, adjust the direction across the, the joint in, embedding component from each subject using pro crossing uh, alignments. Then we have the, the, the component from the joint embedding, um, but aligned uh, well. Um, last question, uh, after introducing many manifold embedding methods and applications, uh, now, uh, how do you think about manifold uh, compared to PCA? So the question is, if is nonlinear method better than the linear methods? So here comes some uh, comparison on the left. Uh, we will see the components from PCA, diffusion embedding and Laplace embedding. If we ignore the arbitrary uh, direction, the spatial pattern of the first uh, three components at least are actually quite uh, similar. After uh, cross, after progressing alignment, we corrected the direction. Uh, the first uh, 10 to uh, 25 components are also very similar. So which means um, linear and nonlinear method in this sense probably capture very similar uh, brain organizations. But if we look at the test rate test reliability of these three methods compared to uh, nonlinear embedding here, PCA actually uh, showed the highest reliability across all the components and across uh, different thresholds that uh, we use to uh, build the affinity uh, matrix. And when we use the, these components uh, to predict the behavior scores, uh, PCA also shows better performance across uh, different thresholds. And the more reliable uh, the component is, a better brain behavior prediction can be achieved. So the complex model is not necessarily better and simple linear model can be also powerful. So to summarize, unsupervised machine learning techniques are data-driven methods to discover the structure of brain organization. And both um, clustering and embedding uh, reduce the high dimension uh, new major data to help us to understand the brain organization. Um, the third, um, unsupervised machine learning is um, data mining approach. Still, we need to uh, choose the model that are reliable, generalizable, and interpretable. And when we apply the machine learning techniques, it's always better to understand your data so that we can avoid potential issues that could mislead, interpret our results. And currently, um, the available toolbox uh, makes the machine learning easy to access, even for the complex model but they are not magic. Sometimes a simple model can be powerful. So to get started, just need to get your hands dirty and uh, play around with the data. Thank you.